Egg Harbor Township as we know it today didn't always look this way. It's hard to imagine a place that did not have Storybook Land or the Black Horse Pike. In fact, there wasn't a single car on the road when the township was first incorporated in 1798. Census records indicate the population of Egg Harbor Township back in the year 1810 was 1,830 residents, just a fraction of the nearly 50,000 people who call EHT home today. And back then, the heart of Atlantic County Municipality was divided into much smaller finger communities with names like Cardiff, McKee City, Steelmanville, Farmington, and West Atlantic City. If you look around, you may still see remnants of these places right in your backyard. As much as we've seen the face of the township change, you can imagine that schools were also very different. Long before the primary school buildings were constructed, there were many smaller schoolhouses scattered throughout the area. In fact, years ago, township schools weren't even housed in school buildings at all. During those years, students would only attend school a few days a year. But did you know some of the original EHT schools are still around today? Have you ever seen this building? Or this one? This building here was once known as the Bargain Town School. According to records from 1914, the building cost just $14,500 to build, and it is still in use today. And of course, there are some schools in the township you probably know very well. Let's take a visit back in time as we listen to stories from people who were educated in the EHT schools and those who have served as district leaders over the years. Their stories will enlighten us on how the early schools have evolved into the district that we now recognize for embracing, engaging, and educating the students of today. to the Apsecan line that became Farmington area and all the Harbor Road is where um, you now have uh, the Walmart store and um, I used to ride my bike all the way to Farmington for 4-H and any other activity that I went to after school and we grew up in a mixed neighborhood on Old Egg Harbor Road and we played with the kids in the neighborhood and they played in our house and their house. It was the beginning of integration of the school system you know nobody thinks anything about it today the school bus we got on we got on together and it was a mixed bag as to where you sat you just got wherever you got one of the seat but when you got to school the bus would stop on the one side of the school and discharge the, the black students then it would pull up another 80 feet to the other side of the school and discharge the white students. And the schools became basically integrated on a very small level. Because when I got to Cardiff, uh, I just got there for the eighth grade only, but I joined what their uh, eighth grade was, and their eighth grade was made up of about 10 other students, and we were black and white. And I went to Barkentown School as kindergarten and um, stayed there all the way up until the sixth grade. And you would get off the bus and line up, teacher would be out there, make sure you stood in line until she, they were ready to let you in. So we probably averaged six to eight students in the grade and then even up to 10 in most of the grades. And of course, the grades were from first to fourth grade in one room in Farmington. 
and that was taught by one teacher. And then it was fifth to eighth grade in the other room, and that was taught by another teacher. And then you'd go in, they had uh, coat rooms where you'd hang your coat and lunch that you were maybe taking because they didn't have a, a full-time, you know, cafeteria like you have now. You were in a row in most cases, and the teachers were um, assigning the, your uh, studies to the row based on the, the grade you were in. Well, I can remember in the McKee City School, we had kindergarten, first and second grade, and they were only one classroom that I recall. Uh, there were probably about, I'd say, 30 kids in a classroom. The teacher would have prepared lessons, usually on the chalkboard. Sometimes you were called up to the board to do the answers. In McKee City School in the basement, I can remember, is where we would eat lunch, and there was like a little stage there that we we performed on that our parents could come and see no differently than like today. If you finished your lunch in the cafeteria, you could go out on the playground and play for that half hour. So we had good teachers and when we went to recess, we played baseball, they had a slide, they had seesaws. Uh, you just uh, participated in whatever you wished to do for that period of time. Then you came back and started your schoolwork again. You know, line up again, go catch the bus and go home. You never forget where you grew up, and that's one important thing I was able to carry on. The best part of those schools is that we knew everybody. All the teachers knew all the kids and all the families. When I came to Egg Harbor Township, it was a real small farming community. Uh, I can remember almost getting lost trying to ride around the town. And then I've seen it grow, of course, because uh, in those days it was just the outlying schools and Swift. Exactly, when we got to Russell Swift, that was a big change for us because that's when we rotated classes. We used to have uh, spring mark in uh, Russell Swift. Back then it was like the volunteer fire company could come and they would start a fire and they would put out the fire at the Spring Mart and, and there were games to play. I started in 1970. Uh, it was when the opening of Slayball School was happening and they were hiring additional staff to supply the new building and they rearranged the district with fourth grade in a portable classroom which was uh, like the penthouse of the district. It had air conditioning, we had our own bathrooms, it was carpeted, it was a big room. Mr. Tom Cook was principal. He grouped reading classes and math classes and we changed classrooms for reading and math, so, which was way ahead of the time in those days. When I started in 1975, the, the school district in 1975 was in a building project. They were building the Davenport Elementary School. And at that time, Slayball had grades five, six, seven, and eight. In January of 1976, the Davenport School opened. So at that time, there were classes that moved from all throughout Egg Harbor Township District. They moved over to the Davenport School. And then the Davenport School at that time was started for the first time with a kindergarten wing. Then the remainder of the school was grades three, four, five, and six. When this building opened, the Davenport School opened, they had a big opening ceremony, and the guest speaker was Vincent Cantillon, who was the county superintendent of schools. And Mr. Cantillon made the comment and his remarks that Egg Harbor Township should have its own high school. And that got people buzzing. <laughs> Building Egg Harbor Township as its own identity um, 
was, I think, one of the reasons why the, the referendum passed. In 1979, if I remember correctly, the school board at the time picked a principal for the high school, and the high school wasn't even built yet. I didn't know it at the time, but there was 126 applicants for the position. I was the successful candidate and became the first principal of Bay Harbor Township. I was against, why are you paying somebody so much money and they're not even going to have a job? not realizing what that principal had to do before the school was built. But you have to realize that there was absolutely nothing here. Not only was there a new building, but there was no supplies, there was no faculty. He had to set all the classrooms up. He had to make sure everything was fine for the teachers and, and, and the cafeteria and, and grounds and, and sport. He had a lot of work to do. There was no Egg Harbor Township zip code. Your mail went to Summers Point, Linwood, Mays Landing, Pleasantville, and you should see the, the circus of the mail that went between Greater Egg Harbor, Egg Harbor Township, and Egg Harbor City. The, the mail, sometimes you didn't get it for three weeks because it went to three other post offices before you got here. Uh, we had to go through the debate as to whether or not we were going to open in mid-year or we were going to open up the following September, and taking in consideration that the students were already in the high school settings that they were in, uh, that we decided it was best not to disrupt not only the Egg Harbor Township students, but the students at uh, Greater Egg Harbor Regional, because the students at that point, some were attending Oak Crest High School, some were attending Absagami. Yeah, it was pretty exciting. Um, you know, the, the school district did a great job of uh, allowing students to be a part of the process. So I can remember being asked to vote on the school colors. And I still remember it was between the black and silver and white versus purple and white versus green and yellow, looking at mascots and being asked to vote on the mascots. So they kind of kept us engaged as the school was being built. And even though we were separated uh, by the different school structures that existed, a lot of us grew up together and it was a small community back then. And we withdrew from Apsagami and Oak Crest and uh, opened up our high school in 1983. I'm going to say there was approximately 1,100 students at that time. The building was uh, constructed for approximately 1,200 students. Now, the first ever high school was pretty luxurious for buildings, considering that we had a six-lane Olympic-sized swimming pool. Uh, we had some very, very nice uh, amenities, brand new athletic fields. Uh, nobody really had a true impact in terms of what casino gaming was going to do for us. Well, while some people were still eating breakfast this morning, it all happened. The gambling casino here in Atlantic City open. As an assistant superintendent and superintendent, my greatest challenge was uh, functional capacity, creating enough buildings for students that were coming into the district. Now, in the heyday of the casino industry, we were getting upwards of 300 and 350 new students every year. And people were just coming in from other states and moving into town. We had to really stop and think of what are we going to do here? All the schools were crowded, but with some of them were, uh, you know, highly overcrowded. Uh, and that's when we were planning the Fernwood and the Alder Avenue schools. Before we put a shovel into the ground, we had to choose sites where we could put the new schools. And the Board of Education owned land, but it was, it was what they would call landlocked. Fernwood Avenue School was an example. Fernwood Avenue existed, but it was a dead-end street. Out in the woods, that was all woods. And the road out that way was just dirt road. And it was, I can still remember today, Freddie Nichols, who was the superintendent. And he says, this is where we need to build it. So we had to go out towards past the swamp and get to the thing. We got the truck stuck. I broke his mirrors. And uh, we had a good time. But you could hardly imagine it because it was nothing but a, but a forest. And we were doing two schools at the same time. We were building the Fernwood Avenue School on that site. And then we were building the Alder Avenue School on the site. Uh, Mr. Nichols was superintendent at the time. He decided that we were going to open the buildings. That was a weekend. 
and he decided to have the bus drivers, the school buses, the staff, the administration all come in on the Friday after school closed at Sleigh Ball, remove all the furniture and put it in the school buses, and move the furniture to the new buildings of Fernwood Avenue and then Alder Avenue. And we left the furniture in, in, off the buses into the buildings, and it was wonderful. And by the end of that weekend, Monday morning, those schools opened. Uh, and teachers were great at the time. Everybody jumped in. Uh, I think we worked 12, 14-hour days just moving stuff from classroom to classroom, getting all the material so we could start school on Monday. And the students didn't see a, a change other than that nobody knew where they were going when they got to the school. At the same time, the state told us we had closed outlying schools. The outlying schools did not provide a thorough and efficient education. They had no libraries. They had no gymnasiums. And then a couple years later, then we had to make all switches again. We, we were growing so quickly that we just couldn't keep up with it. Um, so as soon as they passed you know, a referendum to build, the population exceeded it. So without having physical space, the district had to go to non-traditional spaces. So you could go to almost every facility in the district and find a modular building or a trailer that was erected so we'd have a place to put students. We had a boardwalk at the high school. You walked out. There were, you know, five, six different um, buildings there with two classrooms in each one that you had to leave, go outside in the rain, the snow, the cold to walk over to your classroom to get into it. We go into the cafeteria at that time, the floors were dirt, there were bobcats driving, the, the, the ceilings were gutted, there was no electricity, looked like a war zone. For the high school, because that was growing the biggest, there had to be a tent outside and hold lunches in that. We had to build another school, then we had to change all the schools around again for Miller. Caused our growth, that's why we built the Slave Ball and Davenport primary buildings. That's why the Miller School got built, we were growing. Within a year or so, we were, we were already at max capacity and starting to outgrow that construction project, hence the need for another construction project. The debate was, are we putting a third addition on or are we building a second high school? Uh, you know, all of a sudden you spend so much time building up this pride and this identity in A. Carver Township High School and now you're going to try to do it all over again with A. Carver Township South north, east, or west, or whatever it's going to be. So um, the decision was made at that point in time, let's go for a larger group four high school, we're gonna house 3,000. The community supported the opportunity to build new structures, and one of the best days was when we started tearing down those modular buildings in our schools and putting kids back into their regular learning facilities. To start shifting our thinking from just this survival mindset of how do we fit everyone, to what are we going to do with everyone. And so that's where the academies came into play. That's where different programs and materials started to happen. So where we started to think more about differentiating instruction and individualizing the program for students as opposed to providing a one size fits all. What's a school spirit look like in EHT? Well, it looks a little something like this. And the fact that with all that growth, we were blending in lots of new people and perspectives to the community. And so there was the community that existed for decades, if not centuries, and now there were all half of that community were completely new to Egg Harbor Township and trying to make everyone feel part of the school community and part of the Egg Harbor Township schools, I think was the biggest challenge. When I was going through the school, uh, the K through 12 system, I started around like 2006, seven and all the way till now, it was a very diverse, and very um, multicultural uh, 
population. Like I had friends from all over the place. This is the real world. This is a taste of cultures from, from all over the place. Over 50 languages that were spoken in the district. The difference now is I think we're more culturally responsive to the needs of, of all. And we've made strides to meet those needs. Uh, we actually have like so much more than a lot of my friends have in terms of um, the amount of AP classes, the amount of clubs, sports. It can always be better. Of course it can always be better, but compared to a lot of other schools, I think we actually do have a lot of opportunities for students, especially with the academies and there's constantly new things being introduced. So there's always like new opportunities for students. I think that's, that's something that each, teach, each teach teachers do really well is they, they understand that the, the, the landscape of education is shifting. And so they have to shift and adapt their teaching to, to be more relatable and be able to connect with all the students of today's generation. And so an organization, this, this, we're in a great, beautiful building and it's bricks and mortar and it, it is what it is. But without people, things don't happen. Just everything is so completely different that you, you could never have imagined back then that this would be the schools of today but it was an evolution over a number of years that brought it to where it is now. What I think EAC did really well was, 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 was building a sense of community. I did feel part of a community here. Now I want to make sure people feel it, live it, and realize it. To have the same eagle, to have the same colors on their sports team. The spirit is the same, the feel is the same, and the, and the fact that this is Egg Harbor Township, we are the eagles, and uh, we, black and silver is where we are.